Good morning, Quail Hollow, and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad you've joined us this morning to celebrate the good news, and we welcome those who are listening online as well. We are a church that is intentional about making sure that everyone feels welcome. If you're a guest with us this morning, we invite you to complete a welcome card, which gives us a chance to reach out to you in a more personal way. You'll find a QR code on the online welcome card. And you all have an announcement sheet in your bulletin that also has a QR code. And in front of you in the pew, there may be one of these welcome cards which also has a QR code on the back, or if you would just like to put your information and put it in the offering plate, that would be fabulous. Um, please be sure to read through the announcements that are included. We're, um, they're a little shorter than normal, but I did want to mention a couple. One is to... Um, uh, thank you from Faye and Waldo Miller with regard to all your thoughts and prayers uh, while he's uh, been recovering from pneumonia. Um, and they're asking for continued prayers as he recovers and gets stronger. And also, um, they have celebrated their 60th anniversary together, and I think that's something worth celebrating. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Beloved Jesus, living God, you enter our hearts even when we are filled with disbelief. You feel our sadness and hurt as we struggle to make sense of our world. You express your love for us by offering yourself, and we are amazed. You ease our doubts and we are astonished. We give you thanks, saying, my Lord, my God, amen. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't in the. Uh, <laughs> so. Choir. Keep going. Okay. Uh, please stand and join me in the call to worship. Thank you for continuing to stand. Um, in our fears and through our locked doors. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption. Amid our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter fulfillment. For the sake of a community that meant to be its best during crisis. Please continue standing as we sing together hymn 246, Christ is Alive, in your purple hymnal.
may be seated. When we stand at the baptismal font and confess our sins, we are not no longer doing so as lost, guilty, or ambiguous human beings who are not sure of our standing before God. We do not come groveling, but we come confident as those who are no longer dead in our trespasses, but who have also are alive in Jesus Christ. Without God's grace, we would not even know we were sinners. So we confess together, O oh Lord, our God, we think your best should happen when we're in control. Forgive us for not expecting the risen Christ to show up when we are anxious, content to lock the doors of your house for fear of all that is outside. Forgive us for thinking that church mainly happens inside these walls and not into the world you so love, into which we are sent. Forgive us for looking for your power in all the conventional places, but never in places of brokenness, crisis, and defeat. In your mercy, for what we give, give, bear what we are, and by the power of Christ's resurrection, raise us up to serve others for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Lord, hear our personal and private prayers of confession. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And now for the assurance of pardon. You are already given, loved, and whole. To Christ, you are a fully flourishing human being. So live like that. In the spirit, you're not an isolated spiritual being doing Christianity alone, but you are part of a community of faith. Go build that. By the grace of God, every human being is seen, loved, and made whole. Go practice that. Amen. And now, having received the peace of Christ that passes all understanding, let us share that peace with one another as we stand and greet one another. The, pre the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Thank you.
grace, help us seek you and the truth you intend for us today. Not us not be distracted by worldly pursuits or pleasures. Help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and your word read and proclaimed. Amen. I wanted to just say that Lori Rabel from 
Um, Selwyn Presbyterian Church is here uh, as our pastor this morning, and we're welcoming her to the pulpit. Um, so this morning, our Old Testament reading is from Psalms 4, verses 1 through 8. You can read along in your pew Bibles. To the leader with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Ask me when I call, O Lord of my right. You give me room when I am in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall your honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Shalah. But know that the Lord has set aside the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Shalah. Offer rich sacrifices and put your truth in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, what we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. You have put greatness in my heart, more than their grain and wine abound. I both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. And now we'll have the New Testament reading and sermon Thank you, Catherine, for your welcome. I bring greetings to all of you from your siblings at Selwyn Avenue Presbyterian Church, um, and I'm glad to be here. I've gotten to know many of you over the last seven months as Quail Hollow and Selwyn Avenue have been in a partnership together. It's been a great joy. For those of you who I haven't met yet, um, I am one of the pastors at Selwyn Avenue, and you all have opened your doors and your hearts to many of us at Selwyn. I continue to give thanks for the partnership, and I am curious to see what God is up to between our congregations and give thanks um, to you all who have been tenacious and forthright and steady in your faith. Our text this morning can be found in the Gospel of John. It's on page 115 in your New Testament um, in your pew Bibles. Uh, Easter in the life of the church is a season. Uh, it's not just a day. And our, our text this morning uh, picks up where Mary Magdalene left off after she found the empty tomb. We're going to resume the story. It's chapter 20. It's verses 19 through 29. Listen now for the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. And see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, 
but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. May God bless the hearing and this speaking of God's holy word. Amen. Well, Mary told them. She flat out said, I have seen the Lord. But they didn't believe her. Not Peter, not John, not James, or Andrew, or Nathaniel, and Philip. Certainly not Thomas, none of them. They lost Judas, they lost Jesus, and Thomas, well, he was right all along. It's not that Thomas didn't believe Jesus could do amazing things. I mean, he had seen it firsthand. The bread and the fish in Galilee, the stilled storm, the leper, the blind man, the hemorrhaging woman who touched his robe. But remember that time Jesus' friend Lazarus had died and Jesus called him out of the tomb? That was the moment. That was the moment the Pharisees were thrown into a tailspin and Thomas knew then that things were not going to end well. Thomas called it way back then when he sarcastically quipped, why don't we just head into Jerusalem now so we can all die with Jesus? Now maybe Thomas was a pessimist, but I'd say he's more of a realist. After all, the whole thing had been an epic failure. And now they are cowering in the shadows of some upper room. The door is shut. They are untethered, unsure of who they are. No leader, no plan, no energy, no hope. In fact, the only thing they really do have is fear. Lots of fear. Fear of being arrested or even worse, crucified. Fear of being judged or shamed or even worse, excluded. Fear of being discovered or seen for who they truly are. Or even worse, the things that they have done or the things that they've left undone. Fear of moving on or letting go or changing. Fear of not mattering. What does it mean to trust that God has called you for a purpose and a future beyond yourself only to have that dream never realized or shattered or stolen away like a thief in the night? What does it mean to go all in, fully devoted, committed, trusting, only then to be devastated by loss or betrayal or, worst of all, failure? The doors are shut. The locks are turned. Ever been behind that door? Unwilling or maybe even unable to risk again? What does it mean to carry so much disappointment that the only option is to shut the door and then lock it? Well, we've all been there. We say, I told you this would have happened. How could you have been so stupid? How could I have been so stupid? If we only knew, we should have known better. We never should have tried it. We never should have trusted. We never should have hoped. You see, we've all been there in that room behind that door. And of course, Jesus does not let the disciples stay there too long before he shows up. But the problem is, Thomas wasn't home the day Jesus showed up. He wasn't there. He didn't experience it or see it. Now, we don't really know where he was. He could have been on a cruise. He could have been playing golf or visiting parents. Maybe he decided to go for a hike. Maybe he just wanted to get the shopping done ahead of the week. We don't really know, but he missed it. He didn't show up. He wasn't there. And then for the next seven days, all his friends could talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They heard what Mary said. They'd seen Jesus' hand and his side. And yet they were still gathering in that room together, trying to get their heads around it. How is it that we can experience God's love and grace and presence one day and then still doubt it the next? It's so tempting to isolate ourselves, to protect ourselves, shut ourselves out. You see, 
Thomas trusted Jesus, and it didn't work out according to the plan. And so, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We've all been there. You know, I don't think Thomas is bullheaded, and I don't think he's pessimistic or stubborn. I don't think he means to be a know-it-all. I think his heart is broken. They'd all been through hell. And now he can't trust the world around him. He can't trust the religious institution. He can't trust the government. His friendships are strained. Nothing feels normal, much less safe. There were promises. There were hopes. There were healings and gatherings and teachings and lots of plans. They did all the work. And now he's wondering if the entire thing was nothing more than a pipe dream. Or worse yet, a lie. Because everything he experienced with Jesus along the way and everything he thought he knew about God, well, all that has changed. And for seven long days, he sits with that. And we all know, Quail Hollow, you all know, it is one thing to talk about the gospel, to talk about new life and life after death, to talk about the resurrection, but it is another thing altogether to live it, to go through it, to walk through the loss and regret and sin, trusting in the promises of the resurrection, trusting that those promises will lead you to something new and joyful. I mean, even Jesus doubted when he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you see, the difference is with Jesus right there in that moment, right there on the cross, that's where we begin to see everything differently. You see, if we doubt something, if we have doubt, we doubt someone, it also means that we expect something. You see, doubt is an expectation in spite of our fear. It, it isn't an expression of our fear. Doubt is an expression of wanting and hoping that God will indeed show up. Doubt forces our gaze to shift from our loss and disappointment and shame and grief to God's active movement in the world. And I wonder what could possibly be so important so vital, so life-giving, so powerful that Jesus, the Son of God, would be murdered, buried, and resurrected for it. What is so important to God that God would insist on infiltrating, pushing, forcing, imparting, breaching, breaking, reaching, and dying for? What could it possibly be? Through locked doors, and thick walls, through cold and broken hearts, through illnesses and regrets and sin, what is so important that God keeps coming back over and over again? Coming back for the lost sheep, coming back for the prodigal son, for the man living amongst the tombs, even for Thomas. Would God come back for a wish dream? Would God come back for a fantasy or the certainty of an easy life or maybe absolute answers or maybe so you could have more control over your life? Would God come back for a conflict-free marriage or an escape from reality or maybe prosperity or success or health? Why in the world would Jesus be walking around on earth unrecognizable Presumably, with gashes and holes in his body, breaking through locked doors, uninvited, unannounced, over and over and over again, what? Well, plain as day, we just read the scripture. Jesus says he came to bring them one thing. Peace. That's what it says right off the bat, peace. In fact, he says it three times. But you see, it's not just any peace. It was peace that also came with power. Power? Ugh. Folks like us, we don't really like to talk about power. 
mainly because we have a lot of it. And even if we don't always recognize that we have power, we certainly don't like to share the power that we have. Because if we do, then we may not be in control. And if we're not in control, then we may not feel safe and see, well, that's just it. Regardless of their willingness to risk again or trust again, it says Jesus broke in and breathed the power of the Holy Spirit on them, whether they asked for it or not. They already have it. They didn't ask for it. He just showed up. It doesn't really matter if they're tired and scared. They didn't have a choice. And the problem is we want the peace, but we just don't want to change. And it's not that we are afraid of change, but we are afraid of what we'll lose if we change. And so we'd rather just cling to what we've got than risk failure again. We want control, but the power of the Holy Spirit calls and propels us to leave that dark space of our lives behind and to let go. But before we get too excited, before the rubber can meet the road, the disciples have to come to terms with the fact that this power they have has been, that this power they have serves one purpose. They have bestowed, been bestowed with power to forgive. That's what kind of power it is. You have the power, but you only have the power to forgive. That's what it says. If you forgive sins, they're forgiven. If you retain sins, they are retained. Well, forgiveness, no wonder they wanted to stay in the upper room. Forgiveness is the hardest kind of work. And yet grace matters so much to Jesus. He refuses to quit. Chains are broken, seas are crossed, tombs are emptied, Samaritans are met, weapons are put down, feet are washed, thresholds are breached. We can't flee the pursuit. We can't pretend this is not the single most significant call on our lives, that pursuit of reconciliation. Yes, the scars remain, but the wounds are revealed and touched. Forgiving and being forgiven is the path to peace and wholeness, not just for me and for you, but for all of humanity. And so it doesn't matter. It matters so much that Jesus doesn't quit. No heart is broken enough. No soul is lonely enough. No closet is dark enough. No bottle of booze is large enough. No website, no sports team is tantalizing enough. There's no door thick enough where God's light cannot shine through it. And so Jesus comes back a week later for Thomas. And we honestly don't really know if Jesus really had Thomas touching him or not. But in this moment of reunion, as one writer points out, it is as if Jesus is saying, see, see Thomas, see this thing that has happened to me. See how they punctured my hands and stabbed my side. See, Thomas, I have been wounded. I have been broken. So put your hands on my brokenness, on my wounds. And in my mind, that's the invitation that Jesus gives Thomas to be reconciled. Forgiveness doesn't erase what happened but it does help to heal it. When we are wounded and when we wound others, sometimes there are scars that never fully disappear. And so revealing them to another, showing that we've been hurt, it takes courage and trust. And we're not talking about the kind of forgiveness where we say, oh, let's just forget about it and pretend it didn't happen. That's not forgiveness. We're talking about the touch my wounds, Feel my pain. See, I'm still here with you because I know you're hurting too. You see, that type of forgiveness reveals a way into the future together. So do we expect the worst and then we never have to be disappointed? Is that right? No. Avoid risk and you never have to be wounded? Is that right? No. Do everything according to plan, the right way, and then we never have to suffer loss and despair, right? No. 
This story of Thomas and Jesus reminds us that it is impossible to live and thrive behind closed doors. If we hear this Easter message with remorse or regret or shame or guilt for what has been done or what we haven't done, then we learn nothing from the disciples. We learn nothing from Thomas. We miss the point of the resurrection altogether. Even if our belief or our comfort or our happiness may hang in the balance from time to time, I promise you our salvation does not. You see, the tomb was already empty. The resurrection occurred long before any of this business with Thomas happened. And so Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God, that is just a benefit. Christ died so that we might meet the living Christ in hope and confidence. There are so many reasons in this world to doubt. So many misguided reasons to choose to cut ourselves off from the world. But Jesus refuses to leave us isolated. You see, our need is to be found and comforted and seen and touched and reconciled. As one writer said, Jesus did not chide the disciples and he did not shame them. They called him Doubting Thomas. But I wish they would have called him Hurting Thomas or Grieving Thomas. This is not a story about Thomas's doubt. This is a story about a living Christ, relentless in his pursuit of love and grace, finding us behind our closed doors and saying, see this wound, touch this scar, see how I suffered, and know that I am alive and well. And so it's time to unlock the door and get on with it. And what else can we do but proclaim, my Lord and my God, amen. For communion, let's sing together hymn 518, Lamb of God. If you'll stand.
are nourished with the greatest mystery of all, the grace and the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. So as you come to this table, I hope you will come with humility, but I also hope that you will come with confidence, knowing that not only is this little cracker or this little sip of wine enough, but it represents a bounty of love and forgiveness beyond our wildest expectations or dreams. Before we begin with communion, I'll just remind you all that we'll um, take communion today by intention, which means you'll just come down the center aisle and be offered um, gluten-free bread uh, to dip into the cup. If you prefer, you can um, have one of those little cups with a little wafer in it. And then if you're someone that would prefer to be served communion in your uh, pew, just let us know after everyone has been served and we'll bring it to you. Let us now gather our hearts and mind as we pray the prayer our, our, um, our Lord Jesus calls to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, This is the cup of the new covenant, filled with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, and whenever you eat of this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
one been served. As we give thanks for this gracious feast and we move into prayer, are there any prayer requests that you would like to be shared with your congregation? Continue prayers for Donna Allen's recovery. We give thanks that Faye and Waldo are back in worship. And family is here. Welcome. <laughs> Let's pray. God of abundant grace, we gather today, just as your first disciples gathered in the wake of the resurrection and joy and wonder and even disbelief. We remember that whenever we gather in your name, you appear in our midst, offering us the comfort of your presence and the assurance of your love. And we give you thanks that like those first disciples, you give us community to practice our faith. Grant us grace to hold space for one another's doubts and questions. Give us courage to admit that we do not have all the answers. Make this community where we explore what it means to receive your grace and dedicate our lives to you. We remember that when the risen Christ first appeared to his disciples, he offered them peace. And our world is in deep need of your peace. A peace that is not only the absence of conflict, but the presence of wholeness. We pray for victims in the Ukraine and Gaza and for all around the world. Please put an end to violence, Lord. Teach us to recognize our shared humanity, our shared status as your beloved children, each of us created in your image. Lead us to prioritize peace both in our homes and our communities and in the wider world. We pray for all of those who sit in seats of power, fill their hearts with compassion and their decisions with wisdom that all may have the chance not only to survive, but to flourish. Most of, God, most of all, God, save us from despair. Open our eyes to see the signs of resurrection life that are all around us. Plant hope within us and help us to nurture its tender shoots, that it may grow more robust each day. God, we pray for members of this community who need your care. Ease the suffering of the sick and speed the healing of those in recovery. Comfort all those who mourn and bring rest to all who are worn out. Surround Quail Hollow with love and soothe the troubled minds of those of us who are anxious. Lord of life, remind us of our call to love one another as you have loved us with a love that casts out fear and creates community. Grant us energy to serve one another with humility and hope and keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes again. Amen. All that we are and all that we have first comes from God. With joy and gratitude for all we have been given, let us, our office, let us offer our tithes and gifts to God. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, an heir of salvation, and purchase. 
riches of God. The horn of His Spirit washed in His blood. Perfect submission all is at rest I and my Savior am happy and blessed and watching and waiting looking above and filled with his goodness and lost in his love and this is my story this is my song I'm praising my Savior all the day long and this is my story this is my song and praising my Savior and all the day long. God of grace, you provide us in amazing ways. Accept these offerings as a sign of our gratitude and bless them 
to further Christ's ministry and mission among the poor, the suffering, and the destitute. Amen. Please remain standing and join together with us in our closing hymn, Old Rugged Cross, which will be found in your insert in the bulletin.
And now, friends, may the peace and the power of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, dwell in your hearts and your minds until we meet again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.